Hello, I'm here today uh, with Stephen Perlstein. My name is Zachary Corser. I'm a uh, senior programming director and a fellow here at the Legatum Institute. And we're joined today by Professor Perlstein to talk about this question that we've been dealing with through our series on morality and capitalism. Uh, the question today is, is capitalism moral? And I'm very honored to have Professor Perlstein with us today. He is a distinguished columnist for the Washington Post. In fact, he won the 2008 Pulitzer Prize for commentary for his work with the Post. And he's also a professor at George Mason University. And he has written extensively about this question. And I think he has a lot of interesting perspectives. And uh, we're going to chat briefly today uh, about this question of the morality of capitalism. How can we fix capitalism? How do we define the problem of retooling capitalism? So um, let me ask you, first of all, you wrote a column uh, fairly recently, I believe it was March, entitled, Is Capitalism Moral? Can you tell us a little bit about that column? Um, well, it actually came out of a couple of uh, books written by um, rather conservative, almost libertarian um, intellectuals uh, at think tanks in Washington. Arthur mm -hmm. Brooks at the uh, American uh, Enterprise Institute, uh, chief among them. And the argument basically is that the Republican conservatives were having a little trouble in the United States uh, saying that, you know, really free market, unregulated capitalism was the way to go mm -hmm. because it produced the best outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, that maybe was seeming to be true for some period of time, but why, by the time of 2008 and the economic crisis, um, that began to wear a little thin. Mm -hmm. People didn't really believe it. So they needed a new justification for their libertarian um, uh, uh, philosophy. So it was, OK, well, even if it isn't the best system in terms of producing the best outcomes for the greatest number of people, mm -hmm. uh, it's the only moral thing to do, that it is immoral to take people's money and give it to somebody else, mm -hmm. uh, f fundamentally. And, uh, and so. That's what uh, you wouldn't uh, steal my money, and why should the government steal it uh, on, on your beh uh, on your behalf? Mm -hmm. So that was their basic argument, and went along with that was also regulation, which they view as almost a form of theft in the in the sense it's a theft of liberty. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this was raising that question, and um, you know raising questions about that argument, which I don't fundamentally accept, mm -hmm. but also raising questions on, on the other side, which is, OK, if you believe in redistribution, mm -hmm. um, if you believe in regulation, let's think about the moral implication of it. Because most people who are liberal um, think, oh, yeah, that's good. Regulation is good. Redistribution is good. Mm -hmm. But when you ask them, well, OK, tell me how much re redistribution you think would be optimal. Or mm -hmm. if you don't like, you know, w when will you stop? Um, and if you ask them, they say, oh, OK, I, you know, I understand socialism didn't work, communism didn't work. We, you know, we can't have equality of outcomes. Uh, but they haven't really thought very hard about um, how much redistribution and regulation they want, except that they always want it more than whatever we have now. Yeah. Um, and so I was trying to uh, get both sides to think a little more clearly uh, and, and uh, seriously from a moral perspective uh, about their philosophy. No, I, I think you staked out uh, uh, an interesting and thoughtful position. <clears throat> um, what was the reaction to your column? Um, well, I can only, one, one reaction that you can measure uh, <laughs> is the number of comments that mm -hmm. people make. And at the post, we have a machine, the machine counts the, that, except it stops counting at 5,000. Yeah. And uh, within several hours, it stopped counting. I mean, it says 5,000 plus. I don't know how many. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually read those comments. Uh, I was a reporter and a columnist for many years. And you know, you could spend a lot of your day reading those things, and I don't. Um, but there were a lot of them. Um, and it, it, uh, it got picked up, you know, it got tweeted and Facebooked and whatever, you know, forwarded around. And, yeah. and, uh, and so there, there were a lot of. Uh, there was a lot of uh, reaction. Um, most of it positive, actually. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I think you, you've touched a nerve. Um, I, I'm interested to, to flesh this idea out a little bit. I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think it's true that on both sides there's a lack of creative thinking about this question. I think um, on, on the left you have uh, sort of these well-worn solutions that seem to date back towards a more social democratic collectivist past about this is the solution, redistribution. And I think on the right, to a certain extent, I think you, you have a kind of falling back to a position that you know all regulation is wrong, um, uh, any interference by the state is, is somehow unwanted. Uh, but but I, you know, we don't hear a lot of new ideas out there. Do you agree with that? No, you don't. Um, and you know, that's, um, that's part of the, these things get rather stale and talking was Arthur Brooks at, at AEI is actually, I think, quite good on this. Mm. Um, and he does acknowledge, for example, uh, you, you know, the, the standard argument is we don't believe in equality of op outcomes, we believe in equality of opportunity. That's mm -hmm. the standard conservative um, approach. And so, uh, and, and they somewhat uh, are somewhat principled about that. Um, uh, but it's up to a point. They, they have two problems. Number one is equality of opportunity. So, uh, you know, we should have public schools. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, should you have public universities? Should you have public kindergartens or just, you know, K through 12? Well, you know, they start to start to limit it. You know, <coughs> should you have public recreation programs? Should you, should you have graduate school be for free? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's lots of things. Uh, uh, should every, should people, if, if you want equal, equality of opportunity, should some people get to send their um, children to exclusive private schools that seem to be better? that gives them a higher opportunity. Well, if you, if you say that they should be free to do so, then you can't really argue that there's equality um, of opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just in the education realm. What about health, you know, health and medical in, in, in this country, uh, the United Kingdom? Obviously, everyone gets a minimal level of health care, but in our country, that's not true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, health has some, you know, health particularly of young people has something to do with their success later in life. Uh, we now know in nutrition, um, and uh, so, you know, is that equality uh, of opportunity? So, it's one thing to say, you know, everyone can compete in the marketplace; it's open to everybody. Uh, but is that really equal opportunity? So that's one of the problems that the conservatives have: is that is that they haven't, I don't think, thought hard enough about equality of opportunity. But the second and the bigger problem that they have has to do with. Um, uh, with an assumption that because the market is generating certain outcomes, because you earn two million dollars and I earn, or two million pounds and <laughs> I earn uh, 20,000 pounds, that the market has accurately uh, reflected our worth, what we contribute to the economy. Mm -hmm let alone to the society, just even to the economy. And in the days when we were both, you know, farmers, okay, independent farmers, okay, what you produce is what you produce and what I produce is what I produce. We both had the same weather, we both, you know, roughly had the same land and either we worked hard or, or smart or not and mm -hmm. you, you were better than me. But to say that the distribution of income today reflects solely people's marginal product, is sort of absurd that as anyone in an organization who works in an organization knows, because there's lots of things having to do with power relationship and laws and regulations and norms of behavior that determine in, a, in an enterprise how the money is distributed. Mm. And those things are not totally just sort of market, that there's always rules and regulations and norms that go into how that's distributed. And in certain cultures, in certain places, it's distributed much differently than in somewhere else, even within a market system. So there is no pure market distribution. And, but they sort of believe that there is. That, and uh, they sort of forget that any economic system, any market system is embedded in a social system. Mm -hmm. um, and that social systems are different. And so you have to look at those social systems and not simply, well, the market determined that you're worth two million and I'm worth 20,000. Mm -hmm. um, no, a lot of things went into determining um, 
that distribution that were not handed down, you know, by God. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk briefly about another column you wrote uh, in August of last year called Can We Save American Capitalism? And I, and I thought it was a, an interesting look at where we can begin the process of, as you called it, retooling capitalism. And you raised a couple, uh, two points that I wanted to talk about in particular. One was the question of social capital and the idea of what cap the, who or what capital and capitalism are serving. That's on one hand. And the other, the role of trust in this society of, of, of a free market or a market society of capitalism the role that trust plays in terms of, of, of the operation, uh, the fair operation, or, or the, the, the possibility that capitalism can work? Well, I think in a sense those are almost the same points. You know, economists are very comfortable talking about physical capital, the, the financial capital, the human capital, um, uh, but they don't in their models have anything for social capital. Uh, and, and this is a purely utilitarian argument. This is not really a, uh, a moral argument, mm -hmm. which is that what we find, and of course at the Institute here you know about this through your prosperity index, is that certain economies perform better than others because there is more social capital. Trust is part of social mm -hmm. capital, which is that there are norms of behavior, there are expectations. Um, uh, that people have that either increase their productivity or decrease their productivity. Mm -hmm. And so if you have more of these things that's called social capital, if people trust each other, if they feel comfortable that in the long run they're going to be treated fairly, mm -hmm. then they're going to act in a different way than if there isn't a lot of social, if they feel that the system is rigged, if there's a lot of corruption, um, if uh, if no matter how hard they work, that the owner of the land is going to get all um, mm -hmm. the benefit of that, then they're going to behave differently. And what we find is that in countries and economies that have higher social capital, output is better, productivity is better, that it enhances um, productivity. So you can, just to take an extreme example, if you have an economy where the distribution of income is highly unequal, then you're probably not going to get workers who are going to sit around thinking, well, gee, let's, let's see how we can improve the processes here or the products here. Uh, you know, what do they care? They're not going to get anything from it. Um, mm -hmm. The owner's going to get it. So there has to be um, the, the right incentives uh, for that to work. And uh, social capital is part of that. And we tend, because it's not, because you can't measure it often, it's not in the models. Mm -hmm. And so people who do models uh, tend to ignore it and say that this is all that matters. Or it doesn't matter that incomes are unequal, mm -hmm. uh, for example, or are becoming highly unequal or skewed. Uh, well, it might matter in terms of output, in terms of productivity. Hmm. Well, maybe as a last question, um, where do you think uh, this process of change can start in terms of rethinking capitalism? Is, does it start with government? Does it start with individuals? Where do we look to begin this process of change? Well, that's the most interesting question. I think <coughs> that I have an instinct, maybe the same as the Institute here, which is it probably doesn't start with government. There are some things government can do that tweak things and fine tune things. Um, we could come up with some um, answers to that. But mostly this, I think, is about norms of behavior. Social capital is about norms of behavior. Um, and you need to change norms of behavior. Once they, get, once they get into a business culture or an economic culture, um, they're very hard to change. Mm -hmm. And you can't just pass a law mm -hmm. uh, and say, you know, you must trust people um, <laughs> uh, or you must think this is fair, you know. So it takes a long time for these uh, to change. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to, I think you have to think in terms of social norms. So who is going to be forcing it? Is it going to be shareholders? Well, I don't think so. Shareholders are doing pretty well right now. They're <laughs> maybe part of the problem, not part of the solution. Is it going to be corporate executives? Well, not. they're doing pretty well, too. I, in fact, they still have been resisting change, and they've been the winners. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think it could be consumers, and consumers are becoming more demanding, uh, and they 
um, are demanding not only that they get good products at fair prices, but they're demanding that their products are made by companies that are social, somehow socially responsible, mm -hmm. uh, and companies are responding to that. But in my opinion, where the push is going to come is actually from young employees. Hmm. Young employees don't want to work for companies that they don't think are good guys. Mm -hmm. um, and to the degree I know it's sort of hard now, where youth unemployment in a developed world is very high, that they're g it's going to come to a point in many countries where the baby boom generation retires that, in fact, there's going to be a demand for talent. Mm -hmm. And, of course, even now there is a demand for good talent. And good talent does not want to work for bad companies. Hmm. For companies that don't that that don't foster socially responsible norms of behavior and corporate hmm. norms of behavior, they won't work there. Um, everyone wants to, all young people coming out of university today will want to work at Google. Not so many want to work at Goldman Sachs as ten years ago. Hmm. Um, and it's that pressure, I think, that in the end is going to be the most telling. Well, thank you very much for your insightful comments, and thanks for coming to the Legatum Institute. My pleasure.